Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with my friend, colleague, and fantastic, fantastic imagination, a fantastic filmmaker, Alex Gibney. We worked together on his film that won the Oscar in 2008 for the year 2007 called Taxi to the Dark Side. He's made the film Enron, The Smartest Guys in the Room, Going Clear, Recently, a series on Netflix called Dirty Money, and another that you should all pay attention to on Netflix, The Innocence Files. Alex is the president of Jigsaw Productions. They're doing fantastic work, attracting very high-quality people to work with them, and I'm very grateful that you joined me today, Alex. Thanks for being here. Rob, always a pleasure to talk to you. So, Alex... uh, this is a this is a how do I say in in the realm of stability and chaos, the pendulum has swung quite far. Yes. We have a pandemic that's unmasked many things about our health system and the, about the costs of inequality, economy being torn apart, bailouts that look like the already powerful are being as our corrupted politics would suggest, uh, taken care of and to the detriment of weaker parts of society, which exacerbates that inequality. On the horizon, there's climate change. We've just had a very horrific episode with the killing of George Floyd. I don't know, I don't know how to create much more chaos to ask you to explain, but, but Alex, what are you seeing? What are, what's driving you crazy? What really gets under your skin? And what do you envision? How are we going to, as Eric Burden, the animal, saying, we got to get out of this place if it's the last (laughs) thing we ever do. Amen to that. Um, And I hope we do. I mean, I I think we're kind of on a knife edge at this moment, particularly in this country. And, you know, all of our problems have been laid bare. And the question is, will we get to a place where... Um, we can begin to fix them in a, in a substantive and systematic way uh, that, that really reorients our, all of our priorities. And, and I think there's some hope that we could get there. The problem, I think, is really in the short term, because you have a person at the head of government um, who is reveling in chaos. He, he reminds me in a way of Mao during the Cultural Revolution, who used chaos as a weapon by which he could then you know, administer control and authority. Um, and, uh, and he revels in chaos as a way of bringing attention to himself, because that's what he knows really better than anything. Let's remember, he's really nothing more than a really reality show TV host. I mean, that's what he is. He never really was a successful executive. He only played one on television. So that's the most chilling thing about this. You know, we're teetering on the edge of, of fascism, and, and you see it in the streets, you know, the, the, the film that you and I worked on together, Taxi to the Dark Side, you know, there's a lot of talk in that film uh, during the torture debates about something called command responsibility. Command responsibility is, is, uh, is something, it, it's a criminal, it's a kind of criminal war crime charge against uh, a commander when it's clear that there was, quote, no effective attempt by a commander to discover and control uh, the criminal acts that he sees. And, and Trump sends messages uh, to the police. He sends messages to vigilantes. Um, He sends message to his own evangelical base and the GOP. And the message is, you know, we are the wrecking ball. We can destroy once and for all the, uh, the government of the United States, except for a strong and powerful military. And uh, it's a, it's a, and, 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 and key in that is, is destroying any attempt at dissent or free speech. It's all about allegiance to the uh, personal embodiment of power uh, and power without purpose. That's Donald Trump. So yeah, it's a scary moment. You know, we talked about George Floyd, uh, the tragic murder of George Floyd. And I couldn't help but be struck that, you know, in his autopsy, his autopsy is kind of the intersection of um, 
of three of our great crimes, you know, uh, in ascending order. You know, one is they found fentanyl in the system, evidence to the to the great opioid crime. And I, I view it as a crime because it was a it was an attempt by various corporations literally to make money off of the deaths of over 500,000 Americans um, through overdoses. Then you have the fact that he had COVID um, and it, 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 it testifies to the kind of bungled um, response to a pandemic, which could have been utterly prevented. You look at other countries that did a very good job. We have done the worst job and we were supposed to have the premier health organization in the world, the CDC. Um, but but we had a leader who who thought that the pandemic was an affront to his uh, approval ratings. Um, and so he poo-pooed it and undermined the people who knew how to beat it. Um, and then the last thing, of course, is the fact that, that George Floyd died of a heart attack, an attack of the heart because uh, somebody's, because a policeman's knee was on his neck for eight minutes um, in an act of egregious abuse of power and, and, and anti-black violence that was condoned by the officers around him. And that's what you've seen in so many of these videos. When you see the violence, you don't see other officers rushing in trying to say, no, hang on, man, you know, stop. They're either looking by blithely or they're joining in. So in the autopsy of George Floyd, we see the great crimes um, that continue to be committed in our society, the crimes of capital. Uh, the crimes of uh, of the assault on government and and citizenship and the crime of race, which has been obviously America's original sin since slavery. So, you know, in the death of George Floyd, we're confronted with the worst of us, and we can only hope that um, there will be an apotheosis because we can see what the problems are. We should be able to have the courage to fix them. But we have to get through this very disquieting period from now until the election. And God willing, there will be an election. And we all have to get ready to really literally put our bodies um, on the barricades if necessary to be certain that we all have the right to, to stand up and be counted. It's a, it's a scary moment, Rob. Indeed it is. And, uh, you know, I, I always joke that with a name like Robert Johnson, you're attracted to the crossroads. <laughs> but we are uh, we are at the crossroads right now, and uh, the deal with the devil looms pretty large. But I uh, I think the voter suppression, the use of health to what you might call diminish or skew who can turn out, particularly in key swing states. Uh, I, 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 there, there are a whole lot of tools that could be used by one frightened president to try and, uh, which you might call rig the system that he got elected by saying the system was rigged. Yes, that's right. And that whole rig thing is really interesting. I'm, I'm working on a film now that will come out in September of this year. And it, it, it's a kind of a careful look at um, uh, what happened with Trump and Russia in 2016 and, and also looking at aspects of the 2016 election, which seemed appropriate just in advance of the 2020 election. And that term rigged comes up early, but it was never designed. It, it was always designed and, and, and it was quite consciously being used and fed into the system by the Russians. I, I'm not saying that there was active collusion between Trump and the Russians, but it was being fed into the system by the Russians during this period. Trump picks it up, but the, the strategy was never to, um, you know, propose it as a serious possibility. It was always intended to be there to denigrate uh, Hillary Clinton's inevitable victory, which is what everybody, including Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump, you know, thought right up and until the very last moment was going to happen. So it was a cynical attempt to cast doubt. And now the rigging has become a, a mechanism of power in the hands of somebody who is using it 
you know, purely as a PR tool. So it's, it's scary the way these things can come around. When you, uh, you, how do I say, you're a great diagnostician, your, your ability to see things, choose important problems, illuminate sometimes how truth is stranger than fiction, embrace the contradictions. Uh, I, uh, how does, how does the Piper come and play music now? How do, what's your scenario for the constructive path out of this mess? What are the necessary ingredients? Well, that's really a, a tough question. And, and, and sadly, probably my, my greatest weakness is to see the solutions. You know, I'm trained to look at problems and to examine them and expose them and maybe not so good at, at solutions. But, but you know wait, what? wait a minute, Alex, you and I are grandparents now. We got to do that. No, I, I, I trust me. I, <laughs> you taught I was, me that. You I, taught me that. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was coming around to it. I know we have a responsibility to do it. I'm just saying I, 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 I'm not touting myself as, as one who's so great. But, but here's, here's a little moment of hope that I found. And you and I were speaking about this the other day. And it's a peculiar anecdote for some of the grand strategies that we were talking about. But it's a really hopeful and helpful one, I think. And that is, um, uh, you know, I was watching this documentary called The Loft, which was the loft of Eugene Smith, uh, mm -hmm. the great Magnum and Life magazine photographer. And, and he, he, he had a loft in, on, on Sixth Avenue in New York. And he would invite a lot of jazz musicians over. It's where he took a bunch of his photographs and had a lot of his equipment. But he also had microphones everywhere. And it's where Thelonious Monk was... Um, uh, hold up for a while practicing for um, his great town hall concert. It's called a big band concert. And there was one player, I think it was the um, uh, French horn player, couldn't get the part right for a tune of his called Little Rudy Tootie. And, uh, and, and Monk called a break, you know, because he kept getting it wrong. And he didn't go over him and criticize him like Michael Jordan would have done, in, as, as you saw him do with Scottie Pippen and and uh, Dennis Rodman in The Last Dance. And uh, he didn't even give him encouragement. But while everyone was silent, while this guy was sitting looking at his music, Monk went over to the corner of the loft and quietly tap danced the part so that he could get the rhythm. And as soon as he saw that tap dance, he was like, oh, I get it now. So to me, what that little anecdote about a musical moment and about art, which is so important, is all about teaching and learning you know one of the one of the hardest things we're having a you know one of the hardest things we're uh faced with now is seemingly our inability to learn or even our refusal to admit that we need to learn you know look at the pandemic i mean we are the worst but we're not learning we have you know we have the knowledge we can we can look at what other countries have done and apply them here and instead we just say no no america is great well Let's just face it, you know, one of the things that we could do is to, you know, engage in that notion, teaching and learning in a really profound and basic way. But also what we've lost since the Reagan era, government is not the uh, problem. Government is not the solution. It's the problem. Is this is this uh, ability to see government as an extension of an ideal, that is to say, this is the mechanism for how we can make ourselves truly great. Uh, and that's what it was in Roosevelt's New Deal. It, it, it's a vision for what a society can attempt to be. Um, and somehow we need to recapture that. And we need to recapture it by, by, by looking at problems and thinking about ways to solve them in imaginative ways, rather than simply saying, oh, you know, things are always going to be this way. So let's just get used to it, which is Trump's solution to the pandemic. It's like, just get back out there and, 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 and die if necessary, because the pandemic is with us. We've got to have our economy back. But there are a lot of sensible ways to get back out there. Um, and, and, you know, it, it was interesting in, in uh, another film I'm working on is something that is you know, about the response to the pandemic. And I, and I started to read this book by Michael Lewis 
and forgive me for just blathering on here, but I'm in a roundabout way trying to circle your question. Um, you know, he wrote a, an interesting book called The Fifth Risk, which was all about the transition, uh, you know, from uh, Obama to Trump. And <laughs> there were uh, on the day when when uh, the incoming administration is, is supposed to come visit, sort of like a school visit, you know, to all the different departments, all the department heads were waiting for the Trump people to show up and nobody showed up because they didn't really care. And, 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 and this book is kind of a vivisection of the utter contempt for government. But there's a lovely quote in the book where he talks about uh, willful ignorance. And Lewis says, here's where the Trump administration's willful ignorance plays a role. If your ambition is to maximize short-term gain without regard to the long-term cost, you're better off knowing, not knowing the cost. If you want to preserve your personal immunity to the hard problems, it's better never to really understand those problems. There's an upside to ignorance and a downside to knowledge. Well, <laughs> it seems to me that the reverse of that is to begin to understand our problems. I mean, that's the way forward. Um, not to pretend that they don't exist, but to really invest in understanding them. I, 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 I don't know why I'm free associating on this, but you know, one of the great ways of predicting a COVID ap epidemic uh, or a COVID outbreak happens to be shit. I mean, I, I mean, literally shit, where they've discovered that COVID is transmitted in fecal matter. And so if you examine carefully the sewage of a particular city, you can predict when there's going to be an upsurge in COVID. Well, that's, you know, really trying to understand problems, really getting. Um, and, and so I think, you know, it, you and I have talked a lot about the political economy and capitalism. You know, why are we not uh, investigating some of the fundamental flaws of how we measure uh, what capitalism is supposedly doing for us? You know, we measure it by the stock market. Well, the stock market's been going up just as the, as the country's been going up in flames. You've got to wonder what that's about. And then, um, you know, what's GDP? I mean, it, GDP doesn't measure income inequality. It doesn't it measure environmental damage. You know, all these things that we take for granted, kind of like um, the way, um, you know, it's an inability to learn. So I, I kind of feel like if we were all a little bit more humble and willing to listen and to learn, and this is part of the problem of our 24 seven news cycle too, where it's not about learning really. It's just about being buffeted with uh, data um, that, that, that never permits you the opportunity to absorb it and, 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 and think through it and come up with solutions. So you know, I, I don't know. I, I've, been, I've been obsessed with this idea of, 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 of taking a moment of pause, learning and trying to come up with solutions. But God knows we need to reckon with what is it we want. And then if we, we can figure out what we want, how do we get there? And God knows um, if we could find a way to reinvigorate government with a sense of possibility rather than uh, and, 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 and but sadly, we're going to have to build it back up seemingly from its foundations because Trump has been taking Trump and the GOP since Reagan have been taking a wrecking ball to it. Yeah. Well, I, I'm uh, fascinated as I'm listening to you. The philosopher Stephen Toolman comes to my mind. He wrote a book called Cosmopolis. And the book talked about the evolution from the 30 years war to the end of Ronald Reagan. And if I were to distill what I learned from the book, it was the fault lines associated with the framework of the Cartesian Enlightenment, which work well with the natural sciences, but when it was adapted to the social sciences, created all kinds of masks and blind spots. And as these fault lines emerged, particularly... Uh, two world wars and a depression. The tendency of many people amidst the dread and the fear was to lurch backward toward the familiar, 
mm. rather than to plow forward into the evolution that those fault lines had revealed and to be repaired. Right. And he, he wrote the book really towards the end of the Reagan uh, administration as seeing them as the reaction to the civil rights movement and the various parts of the 60s uh, and the anti-war movement that was what you might call threatening the way in which America was organized and the nostalgic spell that Reagan dispensed over American society caught fire. And, and he was explaining that as a what you might call a repeat performance throughout history. Right. And, and so I, I, I do think you're right that learning and teaching are important. But the thing you said toward the end, which I thought was really right on target, is the learning and the teaching and what you might call the reliance upon expertise is also suffering from a collapse of faith in the quality of, integrity of, and the public nature of what experts do. Right. And so we are in a very difficult situation because even the teachers and learners have a hard time getting traction when our elite universities, what Michael Sandahl calls the tyranny of merit, right. leave us in a place. And, you know, I went to MIT and you went to Yale. Right. But but they're basically saying now we have what a, a, a professor, I think his name is Dershowitz, uh, wrote, we have a bunch of people getting educated to belong to an elite as servants, which the title of his book was Excellent Sheep. And... So we're, we're in a difficult place where real learning, deeply human penetrating learning, right. you don't find that in the Economics 101 textbook. No. And the lateral pattern recognition and the depth, I mean, we, we have made some progress largely through technology that the access to evidence-based work has become less expensive and therefore easier for people to do and and dispels more myths but right. but you know as some people say uh, facts are like sacks unless you put something in them they don't stand up <laughs> uh, that, was, that was a line from e.h Carr, the right. famous author of the 20-year crisis uh, but but the idea that interpretation still matters the facts don't speak for themselves which facts you choose to illuminate and so forth uh doesn't allow evidence-based analysis to get us completely out of the woods. But I, but I think we're, we're in a difficult place. Well, you have to have a moral framework. I mean, you have to have a That's moral right. and ethical framework. Um, you know, I just felt like Scottie Pippen and I passed you the ball and you dunked it with what you said. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. A moral framework, man. That, yeah. That was the dunk right there. <laughs> because w without the moral framework, then you're right. The facts don't matter. Um, you know, the phone book mm -hmm. is a series of facts. Um, there, it's a list. Of, it's, it's a rather well organized list of facts, but they don't take us anywhere. Um, <laughs> uh, so, 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 so that is necessary. And 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 yet, the it's it's a it's a tricky moment because. The, the reliance on cheap expertise or on, or on theories, or it, it's like the unwillingness of experts to examine or re-examine their own um, frameworks is a serious problem. Um, and, you know, examining how, how we measure capitalism, that would be one way of doing it. And, and you know that far better than I. Um, but uh, at the same time, it is really important to be able to explore within a moral framework um, data and evidence and reporting. I mean, I'm, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I believe strongly in, you know, in the idea that you go out and listen to people and you try to say what happened based on what it is you see and what it is you discover. Um, and, and that's where you hopefully come up with uncomfortable truths and it's the uncomfortable truths that are hard. You know, that's why, and, and, and I can't remember whether we were talking about this before we started or whether we've, have, 
you know, but, um, you know, we're in the midst of a pandemic. We're all told about, you know, how people are supposed to, how we're all supposed to wash our hands far more vigorously. You know, there was a hero in Vienna, a gynecologist named Ignat Semmelweis. And uh, he was perplexed by a mystery, which is why one clinic, which was run entirely by male doctors, had a much higher fatality rate in of mothers when they were giving birth than, than the clinic, which was run entirely by midwives. And you could say, well, <laughs> we can guess what the solution was. But he found very concrete result, which was that, you know, that the male doctors were teaching um, um, students in the mornings and they were handling cadavers and they weren't washing their hands and they were infecting moms in the afternoon. And he tried to present this and it was an uncomfortable truth because it called everybody to account. And as a result, they drummed him out of Vienna. So, so expertise is tricky. You know, it's it, it's the cheap expertise that re- and that becomes conventional wisdom. If you don't keep re-examining yourself all the time, it, it, it's that willingness, and that's the hardest thing of all. That's why you know I've been a lot interested in in the notions of mindfulness. You know, where you're you're trying to use meditation to get outside yourself so that you're not as susceptible um, to um, uh, snap judgments, uh, which, which have their evolutionary place. But as, you, as we can see in the way the police are acting toward um, peaceful protesters, not so useful in other instances, but that mindfulness puts you in a place of being able and willing to uh, engage that you may have been wrong. You know, mm-hmm. Trump is never wrong, ever. And he could, he could change his mind twice in a sentence. But in terms of being right or wrong, he's always right. So this expertise thing, expertise in, in, in terms of um, a kind of incontrovertible, incontrovertible canon, which then almost becomes religious, that's huge danger, seems to me. But... Um, but we depend on people, or we should depend on all of us to be able to look at the evidence, which is so necessary now. Do you, am I blabbering? Yeah. yeah, no, 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 no. I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually you're, you're going right into my well because I have been. I gave a talk in Bruges, Belgium, a little over a year ago, where I talked about the only way a person can be satisfied with their life is if they go introspectively through meditation in the case of me and and what I was recommending to examine the feelings of their own neediness and then to define a purpose in their life so that when they come out and their consciousness of their neediness doesn't make them easily distracted getting in front of other people's parades or just seeking applause or money or status and then having what you might call a whopping midlife crisis later on or being ashamed because the distractions of your neediness rendered you ineffective and you waste your time on earth. Right. So I think, I think the, the, the mindfulness is like defining your own true north and listening to your own compass about what matters. But I do think all of us are embedded in society. And if you talked about teaching and learning, some of it is about developing the discipline, but some of it is about the mentorship, the guidance, the institutions, and what it is they teach or try to convince you. Yes is a meaningful life or right and wrong. And I think that meditation is almost a way in which you inoculate yourself from superficial designs. You know, it's an interesting um, issue that comes up a lot in uh, filmmaking and particularly in the role of a producer or an executive producer. When you're confronted with um, 
not I shouldn't say confronted, but when you're engaged with another filmmaker who is doing their best to make a film, and you can see that there are things that that filmmaker is doing that you wouldn't do it that way. The hardest thing in the world is to be able to try to reckon with what it is that they're doing and try to give them some help uh, to follow their path rather than uh, the path that you might follow. Mm -hmm. And it's a really intriguing and important um, exercise um, Mm -hmm. because um, there's probably useful wisdom or expertise that you could dispense and you could say, well, here's how you solve the problem, X, Y, and Z. But as we know from our kids and our grandkids, that's rarely useful. It's like you want to be able to ask the question to put them back in a place where they then solve the problem themselves, which ultimately is far more useful uh, than, than, than dispensing an answer, which may not even be the right answer. Um, mm-hmm. So... You know, that's one of the things we're trying, again, I say with some humility, trying to do at our company, where we're trying to work with other filmmakers and trying to put them in a position to to make the films they want their way. And and sometimes, you know, with our networks, we we run into um, problems that way. Even on Dirty Money, which is a series, we've gone two seasons now. It's a series of which I'm enormously proud. um, It should be. It, it basically takes on corporate crime and corruption. Um, and um, But each director directs their films their way. And, and I was absolutely adamant about that. And I think the, the network at times, though ultimately, you know, network, Netflix was extremely supportive. But at times, you know, they, they felt a comfort in, 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 in observing a kind of house style where everybody would do it the same way. That way they could, everybody could apply the same rule book and, and rubric to, to the critique. But it's a harder thing when you're trying to reckon with how those filmmakers are telling the story and know that they have their way. And so how do you, how, how do you, how do you find a way to celebrate that and, and help them you know, find their voice most effectively? I guess, and, and it's not just, you know, finding their voice but i mean every one of the one of the great things uh you know my um, i had a wonderful professor who taught the bible at, at, at college and i wrote a paper that i thought was so great and and and, and innovative and interesting and he said yeah it, it was interesting and it was fun but i couldn't quite tell what you were saying and and the mark of a you know, the mark of, a, of communication, the mark of a good paper is to be able to communicate clearly what it is yeah. you're trying to say. So, so yeah. to those filmmakers, to be able to help them say in their voice the way they want to in a way that's clear to other people, you know, that's the, that's the trick. And that's, you know, getting back to this whole teaching and learning thing. Um, that I that I think in this period is so important because 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 God knows now, um, you know, writ large, uh, how important it's going to be for there to be many voices to which we all listen, as opposed to the one voice of Donald Trump, which is the society that he wants to engender. So um, how do we get to that place and yet find enough common purpose to be able to move in a direction that takes us all someplace good. <laughs> well, I know there's a woman that I've interviewed in the past named Andrea Gabor, and she has written a book called After the Education Wars, but she also wrote the biography of W. w. Edward Deming. Oh, yeah. And Deming... He was famous in Japan. Yeah, and and his approach was not to have one voice from on high, but to entrust and inspire the people who worked on the line. Because if you believe they cared about the cause and they were down there intimate and familiar with the process, they would evolve the process in a creative way. And where Deming applied this, as we'd seen all of the you know Zuckerbergs and Gates Foundation and all the kind of top-down approaches to education, And Gabor found a group about the size of New Orleans in Texas 
that adopted what I'll call a Deming approach by putting their faith in the local people. And why do I bring this up? Because Alex, what you were talking about as a mentor is that the director's heart is not just a metronome that's following your leadership. There's creativity in that heart. And by your respectful mentoring, you're enlisting that heart along with yourself. And you together, I think, will discover things in the creation of art, in your case, film. Yeah. Where, that that process of unleashing the other person's passion, awareness, is something the audience will feel. Yep. It, and it can be deadened by what you might call a, a coercive or overriding mentor. Right. And I think, uh, I think this listening to the many voices in our politics, listening to the many voices in how we structure education, uh, it, it takes power out of the hands of the oligarchy or whatever you want to call it. But it makes a system that's much more responsive. Absolutely. I mean, I, I remember um, to take it away from the philosophical and get 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 into the brass tacks territory for, for a moment, because you, cause you mm -hmm. mentioned Deming and I obviously I grew up in Japan, as you know, partly. Um, right. And and I made some films about um, Japanese manufacturing. And what, one of the fascinating things about the Japanese assembly line, uh, you know, which was engendered in, in part by by Deming and, and his quality control theories that were greatly absorbed by the Japanese, not so much for a long time by the, by the Americans, was that you make small innovations. Uh, Toyota, um, old man Toyota had a great phrase. It was, mistakes are precious, by which he meant, you know, uh, you know when, when you find a mistake, it's t it tells you a lot because then, then, then you deepen your knowledge. You don't pretend that there wasn't a mistake. You, you invest in the mistake and find, figure out a way to fix it. But the, if you would go down the Japanese assembly line, you would think that, you know, at a place like Toyota, it would be this kind of rigid, um, you know, singular monolith uh, in which, you know, everything was predetermined. But along the way, there were all these funny little Rube, Gerb, Rube Goldberg solutions that they had to solving little problems that were, um, there were suggestions made by people on the floor that were slowly but surely adopted that made the whole assembly line a kind of living, breathing organism uh, of, uh, of, of innovation. What, what a concept. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I guess the, uh, the question right now is that we have a structure that's been founded on a very different system of management and control and what you might call meritocratic, where those who pass the tests or come with the degrees or whatever are somehow viewed as entitled to make the decisions on behalf of society. Right. But it's it's hard it's hard in a highly unequal society to be a decision maker where if you please the powerful positions, chairs at universities, affirmation in large organs in the press, all come your way. Yep. And if you stand up to those things, you're more, you're more than on your own. That's right. You're swimming against the tide. People are trying to take you down. Yeah. So it's, a, uh, it's not a passive environment. No, and, and it's very difficult. All we have to do is look at whistleblowers. I mean, you know, we like to believe that we, we like whistleblowers, but we really don't. We like the people who go along. I, I'll never forget when I was going on the stump for Enron, you know, it, it, it almost um, uh, every stop, uh, somebody w would ask a question like, what the hell does that whistleblower think she was doing anyway? As if she was the problem. And they weren't asking about how could Ken Lay be such a bad guy or how could Jeff Skilling, you know, be so crooked. They were asking about her, the whistleblower, and um, Sharon Watkins. And I thought, what a strange idea. But it, but it kind of testifies to a natural um, enmity that, that we seem to be hardwired for toward people who make us feel 
uh, that um, we aren't as, as good as we should have been. Like, we don't like to be shown up by somebody else, right? Um, and, and it takes an enormous, it, 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 it takes a whole mind shift to be able to be inspired by that instead of to be threatened by it. You'd like to think that somebody who's trying to make the world a better place is somebody you should celebrate, right? So, mm -hmm. but it's, yep. um, we, we are, um, you know, evolutionary biology is teaching us a lot about the gravity that sometimes keeps us on the ground. But at the same time, we're learning a lot more about how we can fly. Maybe that's mm -hmm. the hope for the future, you know, um, we can fly so long as we recognize there is such a thing as gravity. Um, so, yep. um, you know, that's the, that's the hope. Well, it, it reminds me of my uh, board member and uh, senior person at the Financial Times, Julian Tett. When I started the Institute for New Economic Thinking, I said, what is it that I should... Uh, focus on. She's a cultural anthropologist, PhD by training. And she said, Rob, it's real interesting. But the way to discern where the structure of power is, is to study the silences, to study what isn't said, what isn't explored, what isn't challenged, will reveal to you where the structure of power is that needs to be taken on. Right. I thought that was a fantastic insight. I agree. And, uh, and uh, she ha she also gave me a wonderful quote uh, from a man named Rene Char. It was in a book by her mentor, Pierre Bordeaux. And uh, the, the quote was, the spirit in the castle is contained in its drawbridge. And uh, I, I think right now, we're finding out a whole lot of, about the drawbridges that have been up for a very significant segment of society. Yeah, the moat is deep and the, and the, and the drawbridges are high. Right. Yeah. Yes. And the, and the spirit in the castle is, is hollow. Is not is hollow and not generous. Right. Yeah. Yes. And that and that's what we're being challenged to overcome right now. That's what we're being. Uh, uh, well, uh, challenged is too gentle a word. It, th this, it's being thrust at us, yes. and and the level of deep discomfort is is an impetus to change. But it, it's like you said, the resistances are are very formidable. Well, and, uh, uh, it's moments like this. <laughs> You know, it's moments like this where, where we are tested and we are being sorely tested. And there is there is hope that we can come out of this on the other side. Having seen so clearly what the problems are and, and began to be willing to address them. You know, yep. it was so evident in the beginning days of the pandemic um, that one of the key problems was the fact that we didn't have a um, uh, a national health system. So if you don't know whether the person next to you has COVID or not, because that person doesn't have the money to get tested, what kind of system is that? You know, it's, it, it's literally a system that threatens your livelihood and your, your life because you haven't been willing to be generous enough and sensible enough to make sure that everybody has access to healthcare. And as a result, now the person right next to you could be diseased because you, and, and, and infect you because you <laughs> because your drawbridge was up. Yep. Yep. And what's interesting is when what I'll call the unsustainable unsustainability comes home to roost the people in the castle they can feel the rot they can feel the the collapse of morale and the question goes back to what you posed earlier 
are they going to be te learning and teaching? Or are they going to hunker down to the familiar, right. as Stephen Toulmin suggested? One of my favorite books ever is by the poet Muriel Rukeyser. It's called The Life of Poetry. And the uh, first part of the book is called The Resistances. And it's about, in the first chapter is called The Fear of Poetry. Poetry, with all of its ways of which you might call permeating your defenses and so forth, and suggesting new dimensions of imagination, is something many people, uh, you might call, aspire to ingest, expand their awareness. But at those fearful times, the drawbridge is pulled up. And I'll, I'll just read you a quick note at the start of the book. She says, a way to allow people to feel the meaning of their consciousness in the world, to feel the full value of the meanings of emotions and ideas in their relations with each other, and to understand in the glimpse of a moment the freshness of things and their possibilities. There is an art which gives us that way, and it is in our society now an outcast art. Wow. She wrote that book in the late 40s, and it's it's worth reading every every paragraph of this book. I'll get your copy. I love that. But uh, but it's uh, that this this question of which you might call the receptiveness of the mind, the reinvigoration of morale, the bringing down of the drawbridge, the inclusiveness, all all of these things now. The, it's like they loom so large, even in relation to six months ago. Yes. The challenge is screaming at us. Well, the challenge is screaming at us, but it, it also seems like the solutions are right there staring us in, in the face, too. You know, we all blithely talked about income inequality. Um, and, and now you see, you know, where COVID goes, right? And, and, and it catches on in um, in the poorest corners of our society. It's just obvious. COVID is teaching mm -hmm. us, uh, uh, this mindless virus is teaching us more lessons than we could possibly have imagined. Um, yes. And well, I remember, Alex, uh, at a time when we worked together, the hideousness of torture. Mm. We walked around with various people in the national security community, people at West Point, people who were willing to give their lives for their country, their sense of purpose, their sense of honor. And they were appalled. Some of the people who helped us research for that movie, they were appalled at this grotesque use of torture, which your film documented because, well, at one level, it was very tangible for them. They knew if they were out in the world and we were doing that to soldiers on the other side, it would it could be done to them. Yep. But that that sense... There was something deeper, though, I mean, w w which ultimately I found really um, potent. A and that was, you know, if you look at the Geneva Conventions... You know, uh, on the on the one hand, you know, you could, as some people did. For me, it's like, well, in a war, you know, what, what do you care about torture? I mean, who gives a shit? You're you're killing people, so why should you care? Um, but there's something quite potent about the idea that if you capture somebody, um, you're then subject effectively to the golden rule. You need to teach that. You need to treat that person as if that person was you. Right. And, uh, and that's a, a, a very powerful idea that, that there are rules that, that it, sometimes there are conflicts that must be settled effectively by sanctioned murder, war. Um, but that when you get somebody under your total control, you have a responsibility and an obligation to treat that person as if that person were you. Well, that's a powerful mm -hmm. idea that I didn't expect to find when I started that film. Um, but a lot of those soldiers, you know, really believed it. And, and I was, I was always struck 
you know, in the rollout for that film, that how many soldiers um, were in, were engaged by it and, and thanked us for it um, yes. because they felt that they were fighting for something important and that by being forced to become less than human, uh, to succumb to forced drift and uh, the worst angels of their nature, um, you know, that, that um, it, it, it was not something that they wanted, but, but that they felt that they were being pushed in, in that direction. And sadly, a direction that the human being is wired to uh, ingest like a, like a bad drug. You know, hate is a powerful narcotic. Um, and, and so to, to see that the military had this kind of expansive view uh, 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 of humanity in the midst of war was, was, was really surprising to me. And of course there was the issue of discipline too, but, but, but that one, you know, the golden rule idea, um, as being the reason that you don't torture was, was pretty potent. Well, not to mention the fact that when a country does not practice the golden rule and you're a soldier whose responsibility is to give up your life in defense of that country and its ideals. Correct. It's awfully confusing. Very confusing. And, and, and thus Guantanamo. So you have, you know, nothing could have been a more effective recruiting tool for, for nothing is still a more effective recruiting tool for terrorists all over the world than Guantanamo. You couldn't mm-hmm. invent a better one mm-hmm. if you tried, even though that wasn't the yeah. intent of inventing Guantanamo. Um, but a rule, you know, a place outside of the rule of law, a country that is all about the rule of law invents a special location where the rule of law does not apply. Wow. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you expect to be the, the country that is the exemplar? Yep. Well, I want to I want to jog your memory to a night when uh, that film, that powerful film, and I will always tell people to go at the end credits and look at your father while he was still alive, who had been involved in uh, interrogation, but not forced interrogation. I believe under uh, General MacArthur. Well, he, he was he was literally on Okinawa during the Battle yeah. of Okinawa. Yeah. He was interrogating Japanese prisoners. I still have the interrogation logs. Wow! And his, uh, but he was also his in, outrage. Doing, yes, his outrage, which you captured on film shortly before the end of his life, was is is just spectacular. But there's another there's another scene that lives forever in my mind, which is the person who performed the forced interrogation under orders. I believe his name was Damien Corsetti. Yes. And we had a, the, I remember we had a dinner downtown at one of Drew Nieporn's restaurants. And on the way to the theater, he said, I need to talk to you. And when we got to the theater, now, this this is a man who went to jail, but by not practicing the golden rule under orders from his superiors, it seemed to tear him apart psychologically, and then he was scapegoated like a renegade bad apple. Right. But he looked at me when we got into the theater, getting ready to sit down, and he was going to sit not right next to me, but over a couple rows, and he said... If I can stand it, watching myself in this film, I would like to get on stage with Alex and the producers for the Q&A. Yep. I I just about melted down. To watch this guy profiled as both the perpetrator at the center and as a victim what you might call redeeming or cleansing himself by looking it in the eye was a tremendously powerful experience. It was. And, it was a, it was a hugely powerful experience. Uh, uh, Damien, who's, 
who, who had the word Il Monstroso, the monster tattooed on his chest, uh, yes. and was used for his heft sometimes to sit on prisoners and was part of this brutal system that we had begun to employ all over, was willing to see where he had been and what he had done and reckon with the contradictions and the humanity and, and then to stand there afterwards. And I remember, you know, a couple of people were like, well, and, and the audience gave him a huge round of applause and, and which discomfited mm-hmm. some people, but not me. I mean, I, I, I think we're, we're, you know, we're talking about teaching and learning. And, and one aspect of that is, is a reckoning is, and, and a sense of redemption. It's not excusing, but if you can go through that journey where you recognize what you have done, and you uh, take account of it, and you come out the other side, and you have become changed, that is a powerful idea. I mean, we can't, there's where I I fear that some on the left, you know, are are too fond of scolding, and not enough enamored of the idea of, of redemption, justice we need, but redemption, you know, must be possible. Uh, you know, if you really are learning, right? So, yeah, I, I, I and, and that was a that that was very potent. You know, we we, we developed an interesting relationship with Damien. Um, yeah. Well, know. I want to I want to I wanna interrupt you for a second. I'm going to ask our listeners to rewind for about 75 seconds because you were describing Damien but you were also describing the recipe for the United States of America right now. Mm -hmm. What are we responsible for redeeming, for looking in the eye, for correcting before we hand it off to our children? Right. And without that same courage, an unrelenting clarity that Damien demonstrated to us, America won't get there. That's right. I agree. I agree a hundred percent that there is light at the end of the tunnel, but only uh, if we examine um, in great detail uh, our responsibility for the darkness of that tunnel. Uh, that's our only way out to the light. Um, and, um, and that's our challenge. Th- th- that's our challenge, that's but it right. se- seems like one that we can meet. Yes. But Alex, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm inclined right now to create a message for your grandson. Mm or all your grandchildren. What you do is you find the dark tunnels. And what you do is you shed light on the way to that light. And that's a necessary part of the journey. Because if we skip beyond the diagnosis of the true uncomfortable causes, particularly in the face of, like we talked about earlier in this conversation, of elite pressure and power. We never have the reckoning that leads to redemption. That's right. So your historic style, and I know this from our friendly discussions over time, it doesn't feel as satisfying as good news because we want the grandchildren to have good news. We do. But it's only the guy that goes down into that mine with his camera and his light and illuminates the tunnel that can bring us through to the other end. And that's what you do. Dirty money, hard knocks, one of the most amazing episodes of how conscious evasion of the rules yeah. 
does tremendous damage and then is imitated and then government officials justify it according to things like the balance of payments surplus. Right. And when your film underscores the level of ty- toxic nitrous oxide in kindergartens in rural Germany, that is the kind of courage and depth of examination which you have a gift for that is necessary to rooting things out right now. That film was a real, uh, a real journey for me because it, you know, I put my daughter in that film who has exercise induced asthma, undoubtedly from the, from the Knox that she ingested in Southern California when she was growing up. And I remember her fainting literally at my feet in the midst of a soccer game. And we didn't understand that, that, her exercise-induced asthma was so bad that that actually, you know, she was literally passing out. Um, but what was so interesting to me about what Volkswagen did with their cheating scandal was that the expertise at the top, and the Germans, uh, after all, were great engineers, and particularly VW was a place that attracted all the world's best engineers. So at the top, the absence of a moral framework to get back to what we were talking about the, was, was, was um, laid out to the employees as this. We need to be number one in the world. That is to say, in terms of selling the most cars, we don't care how we get there. And the engineers internalize it. They come up with a cheating system that allows them to foil the American p- pollution uh, controls so that they can sell the perfect car, which was the one I bought. Um, But in the meantime, it's spewing unbelievable amounts of NOx into the atmosphere, literally killing people. And you can codify how many people have died worldwide via NOx. So they're literally making money by killing people. And then in the middle of that film, we discovered that, that actually they had designed a series of almost um, <laughs> Hitlerian proportions where they were literally gassing. They were, they were proposing initially to gas people, to, to literally hook a, a human being on a bicycle up to uh, a, a room that was connected to a tailpipe of a car. And then when, when they were advised that that would be a bad look, they decided to get a bunch of monkeys and gas the monkeys. And you realize the kind of, what's that great phrase about uh, economic actors aren't rational, they're rationalizers. So in in the midst of of this um, uh, mission, which was to be number one, they rationalized the most extreme and brutal behavior, which was literally to kill uh, monkeys and people uh, in the service of, of becoming number one. And that was really a, an eye opener for me. And it's not, and, and you begin to understand, it's not like saying, because people get defensive about these films and say, I know people who work at Volkswagen, they're very nice people. You know, that, that's really not the point. We're all nice mm-hmm. people and we all have the capacity to do bad things too. But mm-hmm. it's the incentives that are put in place uh, by a system and, and the moral framework uh, at the top which, if it's wrong, can lead to terrible um, (laughs) fact-based analyses of how to solve the wrong problem. So uh, I hadn't thought of it until you brought it up, but it seems like that that film seems like a pretty good metaphor for all that we've been talking about. Well, I was just going to roll in with watching the people like the public officials in Las Vegas, the deputy governor in Texas and others acting like we got to get rid of all of these quarantines and lockdowns because we got to, we can, we can kill people. We got to revive the economy. And that dilemma between health and what you might call earnings in cash flow is in tension right now. And I see people, what you might call unconvinced by the notion 
of protecting people. You know, I'm glad you brought that uh, up because that's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, because it, 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 it's such an important thing to unpack, the idea that, okay, let's just lift the lockdown and let people die so that we can have an economy. It's such a false dichotomy. First of all, the kind of economy that they're talking about is not the kind of economy that we want. That is to say, we can all agree that an economy is actually another way of saying the way that people survive. So if you destroy the world economy, you're literally, you know, causing enormous damage. It's not, you can't blithely say that an economy is important. It's how we eat. But, but the economy for yeah. these people is the economy where all the, all the benefits rise to the top. And, uh, you know, if um, it, <laughs> I always like, I always think about, you know, if, if you got an invitation to the Trump household for Thanksgiving, it, it would be so you could watch while he eats the whole turkey. And, and, <laughs> and um, the, but you don't need to, to say it has to be either health or the economy. It must be both, right? That's the teaching and learning moment. It must be both. But in order to get back to a full economy, South Korea never shut down their economy. They didn't have to because they were smart about it, right? And, and if, you, if the federal government had been willing from the get-go to engender um, a production program that, that ramped up massively on COVID tests, uh, ramped up massively on N95 masks um, to protect healthcare people, um, you know, had a contact tracing program and a selective quarantine program. You can get back to a, uh, you can get back to that moment of opening up that everybody wants, but you do it safely. So I, I, I find I, I'm troubled by that in a couple of ways because I, I, I do find now that there's been this weird, um, it, 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 it almost became an unfortunate left-right divide in my view where the left is supposed to be saying, no, who cares about the economy? It's the safety of people. And the right is supposed to be saying, who cares about the safety of people? It's the economy. It's a false dichotomy. You know, the economy is important. The safety of people are important. They're both vital to, 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 to going forward. But what kind of economy? What kind of safety? And, and, and what do we do to make them both happen? That's what we should be focusing on. Um, and, uh, cause, cause I think, you know, there is a way for it and, and all we have to do is look around the world, look what New Zealand is doing, look what Australia is doing, look what South Korea is doing, look what Germany is doing. Scandinavia has done a pretty good job out, you know, Sweden is controversial. Um, but, um, uh, but it takes government leadership and, and that's where scientific expertise devoid of political bullshit, um, you know, is hugely helpful where, where daily briefings aren't given by politicians. They're given by scientists who are letting us know, letting them know how they're doing. Wow. You know, the, 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 the current president of South Korea is there because the last president failed so badly. I believe it was MERS. Um, mm-hmm. and, and there was a political cost. I can only hope there'll be a political cost in, in this instance, but yeah, you Th- that that I've been thinking about a lot. That that kind of false dichotomy between the economy and safety. It must be both, and there's a way to have both, but it, it entails a, a certain amount of hard work and some risk, uh, but not the kind of reckless risk that the governor of Texas was proposing. You know, let the old people die yeah. was basically what he was saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think uh, I. I we should probably bring things to a close here, but I, w- I want to just say, Alex, for the young people that listen to this, for the young people that are curious about visual media and about your great chain of success, I want to underscore from knowing you for many years, some will call you a filmmaker, but in this technocratic scientistic ritual 
you're actually a moral philosopher. It's how you choose your questions. It's how you shed light. And it's how you explore. And without that grounding in the poetry of your heart, you wouldn't be what you've become. I learn a tremendous amount from you. And I from I'm you. I'm always Ralph. inspired by you. And I'm, I just want to thank you for being here today. And I want you to promise me that as we turn the corner in whatever direction, and we don't know yet, but I'd like to, I'd like to continue the conversation. But I'm very, very proud to be your friend. Likewise, right back at you. All right, man. Thanks. Okay, Rob, many thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.